Welcome back. I'm Colette Elizabeth, and I created this channel as a safe space with you in mind. Today's topic is a little heavy, and I am starting to do um, more videos that have to do with maybe articles I've read, books I've read. I did a poll, and everyone said, I shouldn't say everyone, but the majority of the people who voted said that they wanted me to talk about some of the current events and some of the things that I've been reading. So recently I read two articles um, that I wanna talk about in today's video. The first article is a, um, a article in the Washington Post and it talks about uh, the toll that racism takes on the brain. Now, as African-Americans, many of us have experienced some form of racism whether it was direct racism, indirect racism, meaning that it happened to us directly or we saw it happening to somebody else, whether it was just out in your face or underground, like implicit bias type of racism, we have experienced it, most of us. And what I will say to you is reading this article about the impact or the toll it takes on the brain, it was sort of bittersweet, one, it was helpful because it helped me to understand that the things that I feel, I'm not making it up. And there is clinical backing to how I'm feeling. So the Washington Post article pointed out that experiences of racial discrimination are consistently linked with mental health concerns that include depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and post traumatic stress disorder, as well as physical ailments, such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And we know that we've experienced those things, or we have relatives who have experienced some of these things, and I'm not blaming everything on racism as it relates to our health conditions, but it makes a lot of sense. Because as we know, many of us know, and if you don't know, you can Google it, but racial discrimination or any type of harm or hurt, it can cause us to just stress out and it blows out our cortisol levels. It just brings them out. And I'm probably using the wrong words for impact, but the point I'm making is cortisol is extremely uh, involved in some of these conditions that I've just mentioned. Uh, cortisol is known as the stress hormone. It means that a lot of times uh, we as African-Americans, uh, we are living in fight or flight mode all the time. I know when I was at my toxic job, I felt stressed. I felt anxiety. I was depressed. I felt it all the time. And other places too. I'm just giving that as an example. So the article talks about how just experiencing consistent assaults on your person due to your race, due to your ethnic background, how the racial stress can wear down the brain. Studies have shown that Blacks are two times likely to develop dementia as whites. And so what the article I believe is showing is that these different encounters uh, with racial discrimination, it really picks at parts of our brain and it causes us to, or the brain to react in such a way that the brain is just exhausted. I'm using that word. They're not using that word. I'm using the word exhausted. I encourage you to read the article. It is very helpful. If you're like me, I'm the type of person who I know something is going on. You may see me looking down. I'm looking at parts of the article, but I'm the type of person, if I'm dealing with something that's hard, it's still hard, but when I have a name for it or when I have some research to help me understand what is happening for me, it helps me to get, I shouldn't say past it, but it helps me to get on to a healing process. That's just me. And this may be helpful for you, maybe not for everyone. So anyway, what it shows is that the changes in the brains 
they're real, you guys. It's not something that we are imagining. And one of the things that the article talks about is just the chronic and constant racial stress. It contributes to the cumulative burden and the wear and tear of the body and overall health. This information and this data that the article refers to has um, been proven. It's visible in neural imaging. It's, they can see it. So again, I encourage you to read the article. It is going to be linked in the description box below, but I don't want to leave us hanging. I just don't want to leave us hanging. What I do want to talk about are ways for us to heal, us as Black people uh, to heal from racial trauma. And I am going to be discussing an article uh, that was written by clinical assistant professor Shar Newton. Uh, she is a clinical assistant professor at the University of North Dakota. Now, Dr. Newton is a psychologist and she's also a professor. She in this article, and it's called Racial Trauma Has Profound Mental Health Consequence, a Black clinical psychologist explains and offers five ways to heal. And I'll put that article, a link to that article in the description box below as well. But Dr. Newton, another woman by the name of Janae, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Janae M. Steele, a mental health counselor, they provide five ways that we can heal or begin the healing process um, from racialized trauma. And when you say, when I say racialized trauma, some people may not really know what that is. I'm going to just give you a brief uh, explanation as to what I have gotten from the article. And again, I encourage you to read both of these articles. Racialized trauma, the emotional impact of racism, racial discrimination, and violence on mostly Black people. So in the article, the researchers, which this is a peer review, she's referring to a peer reviewed article that she and Miss um, Steele did. And they talk about how just everyday racialized traumas, they, can, they, they impact us, racial injustices. And it could be, again, directly experienced by the person or indirectly experienced. So what do I mean by directly experienced? I have been in situations recently where I have had people just glare at me, right? Glare at me in a way that I knew was racial. And you may say, ah, oh, some people say, ah, oh, you guys make everything racial. We know the difference. Those of us who were born in America, African-Americans, we know the difference. We know when somebody is just checking us out and we know when somebody is giving us a look. I mentioned in a prior video how my girlfriend and I, we decided to go out to have a brunch. We went out to have brunch. She drives a, a Mercedes. We're driving. We're in the Mercedes. This man stands like where we were pulling out, where she was pulling out, st stops what he was doing, turns to look at us, looked at us like, what are you doing in that car? But I asked her, do you experience this all the time? She said, yes. This man looked like we stole something from him. That's how he was looking. He was, and did not move his glare. That's an example to me of a microaggression and a racialized encounter that she and I, experience together and we both knew at the same time we looked at each other and we knew what it was about okay say Claire why are you getting excited I, I'm getting excited because it just happened last week so I might be feeling a certain kind of way other encounters indirect encounters could include situations where you know of someone experiencing brutality because of race 
I know of a recent incident that I'm not going to get into detail about because I have not received permission to speak about it. But me knowing about this situation, and this is a recent situation as well, me knowing about the situation, knowing what happened to this person, knowing how it happened to this person, it has caused me to feel a certain kind of way. Uh, I felt helpless because this happened to this person who um, I've met, okay? So this racialized trauma is real. It is a very real thing. So let's talk about some of the of the ways that we can heal based on the article. And so this video is going to be called Heal Anyway, okay? Heal Anyway. And so one of the things that the article says, and she writes in her article, Black Lives Are Beautiful, she says that one of the first things to do is to identify and understand the psychological impact of that racialized trauma um, has. So just identify them and understand it and figure out and learn about uh, strategies for wellness. So to me, what that means is we know that, that it has an impact on our body. We know that. We know it has an impact on our minds is what I meant to say, excuse me. We know that it has an impact on our mind, but I also meant to say, but we also sometimes don't always understand or appreciate the impact that racialized trauma has on our body, how we may become tense, how we may become withdrawn and not want to go different places. I have personally myself experienced all of it, all of it. Okay. So that's step one. Also a part of step one is to learn and understand strategies for wellness. And that's where you get into the self-care. That's where you get into understanding what you need to heal because we're all different and everybody heals differently. The second thing she says to do in the healing process is to start pursuing things that support or enhance your self-esteem. Why? Because when you deal with racialized trauma, I don't know about you, but I know for me, it dings your self-esteem. And I'm talking about even if you are the most confident person in the world, something happens Something happens. I, I know for me, when I was on my um, prior toxic job before I left it and I was experiencing racism in a toxic environment, I found myself questioning my judgment sometimes. I'm talking about things that I was well versed on, areas where I was considered the subject matter expert. So when you're dealing with racialized trauma, because it can cause you to question yourself. I think that's when I started dealing with imposter syndrome. I never had that problem before, ever, ever, ever. Why? Because I knew I earned my to the table. But sometimes when you deal with these different incidents every day, all day, it wears at you. And, and if I'm honest, it took me a minute to, to get back, to start popping my Collar, as we used to say, it took me a minute to get back to that. I'm back to it now, but I have to tell you that it, it took me a while. The third thing uh, is to uh, get your bounce back on. And what do I mean by that? I mean, uh, building up resilience. And that's what she says, building resilience. I call it the bounce back muscle. And in the article, uh, she talks about the ability to bounce back and persevere can come from connecting with individuals, family, and community. Um, for me, it was a little different. I did connect with people, but I had to do that after I withdrew. Maybe that was a form of depression. I had to withdraw, heal, renew, and then I was able to go out of myself. I think it's important in my channel 
I do talk about resilience. And when I speak about resilience, you will always hear me say, but if you need to take some time, take some time. Because to me, taking that time, taking that rest, doing that pivot, doing whatever you need to do, that is also a part of resilience. So that was the third stage or step in healing anyway. The other thing that she talked about for is to start practicing some self-agency. This will help, and I'm looking at my notes, this will help to start rebuilding. It goes back to the other one, rebuilding your confidence. Because you never realize how much impact some of these actions have on you. For me, I didn't realize how much of an impact my situations were having on me until I actually got out of the situations. It was not until I actually removed myself from that toxic environment. I call it a sewer. It was not until I released myself and left from that sewer was I that I was able, excuse me, that I was able to actually say, this is sick. And I use the word sewer purposely because when you think of a sewer, what's in the sewer? I ain't even going to use the words because my mom and my aunt Charlene is watching, but we know what is in the shore, sewer. Okay. And it, 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 it rhymes with it. We know that's in the sewer. And so if you're in a sewer and you've been in there for a minute, you've been in there living, swimming, whatever, and you get out of that sewer, you still have that on you. I want to say this before I move on. Sometimes you can live in an environment like that with a smell, with a whatever, and it becomes normalized. So you may not even smell the you know what. Everybody smell like that because why? It's a sewer. Everybody, everything smells like the stuff in the sewer. But when you get out of that sewer and you are washed off, you're clean, you don't have that stuff all on you anymore, you realize that was some stuff. You realize what kind of funk it was. I'm going to just be honest, okay? And so at that point, I feel that that you can start to really assess what it was you were dealing with and where you are and how it in fact in, impacted you. One of the things that Dr. Kumani Norrington Sands says all the time, and I completely agree with her. I never got it, never heard it that way. But one of the things that she says when she talks about why she encourages individuals to leave a toxic job. And I'm going to extend that to a toxic situation, a toxic relationship, whatever. But one of the things she always says is that you cannot heal in the place that is harming you or that is hurting you. So when you leave that situation, again, like I mentioned earlier, your eyes are open because a lot of times when we're in these toxic situations, we are numb. We can't smell, we can't see, and sometimes we can't even hear. Why? Because we are in autopilot and we just trying to get through today. I remember when I was dealing with my toxic racialized trauma at work, all my energy went into getting through the day. All of it, 100% of my energy went into getting through the day, okay? When you leave that toxic environment, when you get out of that sewer, you can now start to looking forward towards, to me, healing. That's how it happened for me. The fifth way of healing that the article talks about, and it's the reason I do what I do, it's the reason we have this channel, it's the reason I say it's a safe space for us, okay, us being Black women, and it's what I'm trying to do. It is building a community. 
right? She talks about that when we, as individuals, when we build a community and have that sense of belonging, it helps us because a lot of times when we're going through trauma, racialized trauma is what we're talking about today, we feel isolated. We feel alone. We feel like nobody else knows what I'm going through. Why? Because we are on these islands. Sometimes we're put on those islands and sometimes we put ourselves on those islands. I know for me, I just felt alone. Now I talked about what I was going through with everybody who would listen, my mama, my kids, they knew the people's names, all of that. But I still felt isolated. I felt so alone. I feel like nobody knew what I was going through. And when I read my comments of the videos that I have done about leaving a toxic work environment, so many of the comments say that they feel alone. They felt alone. And so many of them have said that these videos have been helping them um, because it helps them to understand that they are not alone. And that is a way of building community when you understand and realize, hey, there's other people going through this. Now, this community that I am building, I am specifically targeting African-American Black women. But if you are watching this video and you are not an African-American woman, maybe you're an African-American male, maybe you are not Black at all, it's an opportunity to create community specific for you. Okay. I invite you to do that, but community is so important and it's why I do what I do. It's why I support the content creators that I do. It's why I refer you to the resources that I do because we are in this thing together. African-American women, I just want you to know that we're going to be fine. Brothers, we're going to be fine. We really are. We have been through some stuff for hundreds of years. And let me tell you something, don't count on everyone understanding what we have been through. Even the people who look like us, some of them don't understand. The people who are from, not from this country that look like us, some of them won't understand. Many of them have been in the situation that we've been in but they are not in their country. They're in another country. And like Dr. Norrington Sands says, you cannot heal where you are harmed. So many times other Black cultures wonder, what's up with African-Americans? Well, what's up with us is we are still in the country that has been harming us. We didn't leave. Some of us are leaving. Some of us are going to the continent. And when I say the continent, my community should know what I'm talking about. And I'm not saying that there aren't concerns and challenges on the continent, but some of us are doing better over there. Why? Because we have left where we were harmed. Okay. And I, I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope this has been helpful. I plan to do more videos where I read an article or a book or whatever and discuss what what's on my mind you guys voted on that so thank you for watching if you have found this content helpful give it a thumbs up so that the youtube algorithm or share it with other individuals if you have ideas of content you would like me to create or topics you'd like me to discuss is what i should say drop those in the comments and just comment about this video respectfully i like the comments. I read the comments. And if you have not subscribed to the channel, take this opportunity to subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so that you are made aware when I create new content. Until the next video, 